Hello again. My name is John Frankie. As you know, I'm the theologian in residence here at Second Presbyterian Church. And this is week three of our study, What Happened on Good Friday, Exploring the Meaning of the Cross. And in the first uh, study, we talked about um, the importance of that idea and that there are multiple understandings, not just one, that we see in scripture and in the history of the church. We talked about the reasons for that being because of a variety of pictures of what happened on Good Friday that we have in the Bible, and then coupling that with uh, different cultural settings in which the Bible has been read and different church traditions, we have a variety of pictures. And last week, we talked about the idea of redemption and that major theme of redemption, and we looked at three ideas connected with that. The first was that Jesus... Uh, life and death was a, a recapitulation of the human experience. We talked about the ways in which scripture pictures Jesus' death as a ransom uh, for human beings who are trapped and caught up in the ways of sin. And we saw how that has been personified in some cases, even with Satan or the devil. Um, and, and then the third idea was that Jesus' death was a victory over death, a victory over the grave. And we talked about the ways in which all of these ideas have been particularly motivated by God's deep and passionate love for God's creatures, for human beings, for us. And so because God loves us, God redeemed us from our hopeless situation. Now, well, all of the theories of atonement or the ideas of atonement that we will look at, and really all of them that I know of, have love in the picture. That is, love is behind uh, all of them. Uh, the focal point of what we're looking at today, this idea of satisfaction, the focal point here is not so much the love of God, although it's in the picture, but rather the justice of God. The focal point here is the justice of God. This position says that the death of Jesus is to make restitution in order to satisfy the anger of God. And yes, the Bible pictures God as being angry over human rebellion. God is angry over the ways in which human beings have said no to the ways of love and in, to the ways in which human beings have preferred not only to go their own way, but to oppress others, to kill others, to take advantage of others. And this makes God angry. And so since one of the attributes of God is justice, uh, in this idea, this picture, God does not simply ignore, gloss over, and forgive affronts to justice without restitution. And this relates to a legal concept that has been common in many human societies, certainly in the Hebrew tradition and in the Greek tradition, uh, this legal idea of balancing out an injustice. Um, a key figure then in this, the development of this satisfaction theory of atonement um, that we're going to look at is a guy named Anselm of Canterbury, who died in about 1109. Now, before I talk about Anselm, here's a biblical passage, Colossians 2, 13 through 14, this idea. It says, when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. So there's been a record against us. And God erases that with all of its legal demands. He set this aside, the passage says, and here's the key, nailing it to the cross. God sets that aside. God doesn't just set it aside by winking at it, saying we're not going to worry about it, but he does it by nailing it to the cross. And so theologians in history have talked about this idea as the satisfaction uh, that God required 
in order to redeem us or to save us. So Anselm of Canterbury is the theologian who is most connected with the development of this view. Now Anselm, remember we talked about at the beginning of in this study, and even I mentioned it today in the introduction, how culture also plays a role in how texts are read and developed. Anselm is right in the context of an economic system known as medieval feudalism. In medieval feudalism, there are lords and there are serfs. We're going to simplify it a bit. Lords are landowners. Serfs are people who, to whom the Lord says, you can have a piece of land. It's my land, but I'll allow you to work it. And you can sustain yourself on it. You can grow food. You can set up a house. But in order to do that, I require certain uh, uh, reciprocations. Um, so for instance, a portion of the food that you raise has to be given to the Lord, a portion of the food raised. Uh, if the Lord goes to war, your sons or fathers might be called on by the Lord to go to war with him, right? So that was the arrangement. Well, what happens sometimes, we can just imagine, is somebody might say, yeah, uh, you know, I'd like a little bit more for myself. So instead of giving, let's say, the 10% that I agreed to, I'm going to give 5%. And I'm going to hold some back because I would like a little more. And what happened if the Lord found out about that? Well, there was a remedy for that. Uh, the person who withheld the amount, so let's say in this case 5%, would be required to satisfy the anger of the Lord, the landowner, by giving not only the 10% owed, but to give an additional amount, at least the amount that you, you held back, so 5%, and maybe a bit more, to satisfy uh, the anger of the feudal Lord, and to satisfy justice. So Anselm takes that very idea and applies it to Jesus in a famous book, uh, Why Did God Become Human? In its Latin title is Cordeus Homo. Anselm develops this satisfaction idea right on these lines, right? God, uh, the Lord, established human beings in the garden, gave them a set of a, a rule, um, and when the, that rule was broken, they could only be redeemed by God through satisfying God's anger, God's wrath, God's sense of justice. Except the challenge became that what does God require of human beings? Not 10% of our best or 20 or 30, but everything. Uh, and so human beings are in a pickle. Uh, the only way that we could be made right with God was to satisfy God's justice, which would require giving more than we were required to give. But if you're required to give 100%, you can't give 110%. I know we like to say that in sports metaphors, but if you think about it, it's really not possible. And so there's a bind. Human beings are the only ones who can legitimately satisfy uh, God's justice, but they're unable to do so. And Anselm says that's why God became human. So God sends Jesus to satisfy God's justice. And what does Jesus do? Jesus lives a perfect life. He does everything that God requires. He is completely obedient. So he's met the standard. But to satisfy God's justice, Jesus goes over and beyond what is required by submitting himself as one who is innocent to an unjust death, the death on the cross. So it's precisely in going to die on the cross, even though he was completely innocent, he has gone over and above what God required and thereby satisfied God's sense of justice. Because Jesus is deemed to be not just divine, but human, Jesus does this in Anselm's reckoning on behalf 
of all human beings. So God's justice or anger is satisfied and human beings are redeemed. Um, it's a very powerful theory. Uh, it came to dominate uh, the medieval world and much of Western Christianity, uh, and in many ways still has um, resonance with lots of folks. A related idea is this idea that Jesus is our merit, that Jesus uh, satisfies God's justice by earning uh, salvation for human beings. In this conception, Jesus redeems, there's that redemption word again, redeems human beings by meriting or earning grace and salvation on their behalf. So in Anselm's theory, in Sabbath, he, he earns it by going above and beyond. And this is similar, uh, that Jesus earns that salvation by living a perfect life. This was controversial for some because it seemed to suggest that salvation had some basic connection to works. And the question was, how can it be an act of God's free mercy and yet Jesus earns human salvation through meritorious good works. And the response to this is, is this legal element, which is in view in, certainly in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we see this due to the role that good works play in the judgment of God in the New Testament. Uh, in every passage, where the immediate context is the final determination of eternal life, the basis for that judgment is always deeds in every place. It's always based on what was done. James 2.24 reads, so you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So this legal idea is in play, but the idea is that Jesus, who is fully human, stands in our place, we're gonna talk more about substitution next week, and is the one who earns that salvation for us. Uh, Romans 5, 18 through 19 says, therefore, just as one man's trespass, that would be Adam, led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness, Jesus' righteousness in the life that he led, leads to justification and life for all. Just as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. We also see that theme, right, in the recapitulation uh, re, uh, idea that we talked about last week. These satisfaction motifs, these, this motif of merit, become very important in the development and one of the key themes in this idea of what did Jesus do on the cross? What happened? Interestingly, one of the leading uh, Protestant theologians who argues for this merit idea is none, none other than John Calvin, who picks up on this theme in Scripture and says that, yes, uh, Christ in a real way is our merit. These ideas are very important in the history of the church, and for some, they seem troublesome, the idea that God has to have... Um, some justice here. Um, why can't God just forgive? But I think it's important to remember uh, that justice is part of, is one of God's attributes. And so in the in this picture, um, justice, it's God's actions in Christ are motivated by God's love, but there is a need, a desire on God's part, or even a need to satisfy justice. And if we think about that in our own context, it reminds us that repentance for past failures um, is not something that we can just say, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, and then we're done with it. But that justice requires some restitution. And Jesus has made restitution for uh, the failures of humanity uh, in ages past. Um, and so how does this idea of justice play out in our thinking? I think it's a very important motif. And so if last week we really put the emphasis on God's love, here we find an emphasis on God's justice. And we see the ways in which 
Jesus makes satisfaction for our shortcomings before God and the ways in which Jesus merits uh, salvation uh, on our behalf before God. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Uh, I hope that you have great conversations or uh, with the groups that you're in or as you think about this. Uh, next week, we will turn to the well-known theme of substitution. Uh, I hope that you are having a meaningful Lent and that God is at work in your life. I wish you God's peace this day. Amen.